If you have a Bible, please open it to Galatians chapter 1. We're going to read the chapter together and then open it. Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting Him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to one that we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it, and I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days, and I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother, In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. And then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. So what you see immediately in this first chapter, especially at the end of verse 9, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one that you received, let him be a curse, let him be anathema, let him be damned. So what you see immediately is that in this chapter, in this letter, in this conference, based on this letter, in the Reformation, exploded by this letter, in the Christian faith that stands or falls with the message of this letter, what you see is that the Christian faith and the Reformation in this conference, in this book, in this chapter, deal with things on which your eternal destiny hangs. Let them be damned if they come preaching another gospel. You get the gospel wrong, you perish. And therefore, this letter and this conference and the Reformation and Christianity 
should cause there to echo in your heart an unparalleled seriousness about life and worship. Unparalleled seriousness. Unparalleled seriousness of joy. <laughs> that grace and peace is ours in verse 3. Joy that deliverance from this present evil age and its destruction is yours in Christ Jesus. Joy that there's an all-satisfying glory of God being exalted through this letter in verse 5. Unparalleled seriousness of joy and unparalleled seriousness of astonishment. The people you know, people in your church, people in your family are walking away from the gospel of grace and perishing because somebody has held out to them an alternative that for some insane reasons seems superior. And you want to say, how can you do that? You are astonished with serious astonishment. And third, an unparalleled seriousness of Anger in verse 7. Let them be accursed. So there's this group purporting to be from James. Says that in chapter 2. And they are distorting the gospel, adding to the gospel. And Paul is calling down a curse on them. Whose curse? Paul's. Chapter 3, verse 13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Paul is calling down God's curse upon people who are directing people away from the curse remover. And it makes him furious that people in the name of Jesus would direct people away from the curse remover, the curse bearer, the substitution, and the one who takes on all the wrath for us. So he's really angry, and he's calling down God's damnation upon those who would direct people away from the damnation remover. So we are a serious people. You, you can't read the New Testament. You can't read this chapter and be glib, trifle, joke around with the Bible. The people in your life who are being enticed by alternative gospels desperately need you to talk to them like this. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? Did you suffer so many things in vain? If it is in vain, woe to the pastor and the worship leader who creates an entertainment atmosphere where these truths are impossible to feel. It matters what the service feels like. Because these truths have to be home. They have to be at home somewhere. And they should be at home when we meet God Almighty face to face in worship. Two great truths were recovered by the Reformation out from under the mountain of sacramentalism and ritual and meritorious works of the Roman Catholic Church. One was the absolute, unique, supreme authority of Scripture over Pope 
over councils, over every body in the universe except God. And secondly, the precious gospel of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, on the basis of Christ alone for the glory of God alone. Those two glorious things were recovered by the Reformation from under a mountain of sacramentalism and ritual and meritorious works. They're called, by some, the formal principle of the Reformation, and, by, and the other one is the, the material principle. Formal, the authority by which we say what we say, and the material, what's the stuff of it, namely at the heart, justification. Those two recoveries happen in large measure because of Galatians, because not coincidentally, that's the way Galatians is structured. The first two chapters of Galatians are about the formal principle, Paul's authority. And everything hangs on it as far as he's concerned. If he's a second-class apostle, he didn't get his gospel straight from Jesus, it's over as far as he's concerned. And chapters 3 and 4, the material of justification by faith, 5 and 6, what does it look like in life? So my assignment, chapter 1, kind of frustrating because I like the material not horrible. Oh, this is a good chapter. I'm okay, Don. It's all right. <laughs> I'm having, I had a very good time getting ready for this. So I'm in chapter one, and I want to see how Paul argues for what he's arguing for. Here's how I'm going to do it. This is kind of a little lesson in homiletics. Take it or leave it. Nothing authoritative about this. I love to read a paragraph or a chapter and see how the author said it, and then I love to just claw in there and rebuild the argument without losing anything, but I think gain, 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 by putting at the bottom and the first thing the most foundational reality and then what resulted from that, and then what resulted from that, and when what resulted from that, until you get to the main, highest, supported by everything level. So that's what we're going to do. I've got eight steps. Eight steps that are built, as I understand his logic, not in the order that he gave them, but in the order of how they actually, in reality, come into being. I try to explain this to the seminary guys we have, and it doesn't always make sense to them. So let me, let me give an illustration. You come up to me and you say, I can't talk now, I'm late, I have to hurry or I miss my train. How many propositions? Four. I'll say them again. I can't talk now, I'm late, I have to hurry or I miss my train. You, you just totally get that immediately. There is no difficulty understanding that. You know why? Because there's only four. There aren't 70, like there are in Galatians 1. <laughs> so, I could, if somebody said, what did, what did she say? And I, I, would, I could just repeat it. She said, I can't talk now, I'm late, I have to hurry or I'll miss my train. Or I could do exposition and rebuild the argument from the most foundational thing to the conclusion, which would go like this. Um, she was late. Therefore, she's about to miss her train. Therefore, she was in a big hurry. Therefore, she couldn't talk to you. That's a totally different order of propositions. That's exactly the logic I think she meant. So that's what we're going to do. Galatians chapter 1, rebuild the argument from the bottom up. And 
And the reason I find this helpful, as I said, is that most of us preach on sections that are a little longer than, than four little tiny two-word sentences. We preach on units, and those units have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 propositions, statements in them, and there's just no way your people can follow it. No, they can't. They cannot put the pieces together as you read the text. You've got to help them. That's what preaching is, end of homiletics, no authority there, just my preference. The rest has authority. If I'm seeing what I hope I'll help you see. Step number one, the very bottom, it's in verses 15 and 16. I'll state it, then we'll read it. God set Paul apart for his salvation and apostleship before he was born. That's where it starts. Verse 15 and 16. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who had called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. So God chose Paul before he was born to be an apostle to the Gentiles. It's not even a main clause. Just threw it in there. Or did he? Is anything thrown in under inspiration? Why? Why would he point this out? Why would he bother going back into eternity, back before birth, to point out, that's where my apostleship started. Well, it's really relevant to what he's trying to accomplish here in establishing himself not as a self-appointed apostle or a Peter-appointed apostle, but a Christ-appointed, God-appointed apostle. So the first thing that it means is his mission, God's mission to include the Gentiles through Paul was not an afterthought in the mind of God. It's not as though God was watching the 12 go about their mission and saying, this is not working. They're just hung up in Judea. I've got to come up with plan B. I need to get a diaspora Jew who's got some savvy how to get this work done and get it going. Go. That's not the way it happened. God planned for the Apostle Paul to be the spearhead of the Gentile mission before he or the apostles were apostles, or Paul was even born. That's the first thing. This thing was not an afterthought. Paul's being an apostle wasn't plan B, it was plan A. You hear that, Peter? James, not plan B. Second implication. Paul's being set apart for this work before he was born means he didn't simply put himself forward. It wasn't just his idea. He, he was not warming to this while he killed Christians. He wasn't. Look at verses 13 and 14. You, for you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it, and I was advancing, I was advancing in Judaism. I wasn't advancing toward Jesus. I was advancing in Judaism before, beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. In other words, God chose me before I was born and let me become a murderer of his children so that when he called me, it would be plain it wasn't my idea. Right? You think God didn't know what Paul was going to become? So he chooses him in the womb. He spends a decade killing Christians. 
you're mine, Damascus Road. You know, you might say, about time. You know, if you chose him in the womb, you might have called him at 12. It would have saved lives, not God's way. Clearly then, that he was chosen in the womb is massively relevant. It's not plan B, not my idea. God has made me an apostle. Step number two, up one level in the argument, God called Paul to himself by revealing Christ to him. Now this should sound Pauline, as <laughs> it is. Those whom he predestined, he called. Those whom he sets apart before they were born, he calls. Verse 15, when he who had set me apart before I was born and called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me. I, I think that calling and that revealing are probably simultaneous. The opening of Paul's inner being to the glory, truth, beauty of the son was the effectual call of Paul into life and into apostleship. They weren't separated events. So before he was called, he was destined, and when he was destined later, he was called. It says in verse 16, he was pleased to reveal his son to him. That's how the, the call happened. The, the literal, it's, it causes a lot of interpreters to stumble that the word is revealed in him, not to him, revealed in him. And I think the idea there is that this was on the Damascus Road, when that light shone and that voice was spoken, it just didn't happen to Paul. Like, whoa, that's bright, that's scary. It went. <laughs> totally in, just totally in, and in there with the eyes of the heart, Ephesians 1.18, in there he saw, that's real, that's true, that's beautiful, that's glorious, if you are anything, you are everything, my religion is over. <laughs> you read Philippians 3. Anybody has reason for boasting in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, Hebrews as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to law, a Pharisee, as to righteousness in the law. Blameless. That's dung now because I've seen. That's what happened. He revealed he revealed, God revealed his son in him, in him. So it's not like right now I'm revealing Jesus to you, and there'll be a lot more. If God shows up here in this conference, whoa, way more than that will happen. Something deep inside of you, something deep in you, the real you is going to either say, don't want anything to do with that, or This is everything. Step three, he avoided all contact with the 12 apostles by going to Arabia for three years, or maybe part of that was in Damascus, and then he spent only 15 days getting to know Peter. So the point of verses 16 to 21 is that Paul didn't consult with flesh and blood while his new understanding of everything he'd ever thought about the Old Testament was being formed. So he was getting his gospel from Jesus, he was getting his authority from Jesus, and he was not consulting with flesh and blood with any man at all. So let's read those verses, 16 to 21. 
A couple of comments as we go. When God was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles or reveal him in me, I did not immediately, but now the word immediately in the Greek is it's, it's, it's in an odd place. It's at the beginning. Immediately I did not. It's like, okay, immediately I saw, whoa, this is not a time to check out my facts with Peter. I have met Christ. Like, why would I want to go say, Peter, is that hallucination? Flesh and blood, I realized immediately this is not a time to depend on any human input. God is calling me. He's, a, he's authorizing me. He's giving me a divine revelation. I am not showing up in Jerusalem for years because I've got to make sure they know this is real. Verse 17 Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. You can hear immediately. Okay, he's claiming to be an apostle. This is a transaction of enormous proportions, those who were apostles before me. Verse 17, middle of the verse, but I went away to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I did finally go up to Jerusalem, historio, in order to get to know, very interesting word, just to get to know Cephas, and I remained with him 15 days, two weeks, What's the implication? I didn't go to school with Peter. I didn't spend three years with Peter. Peter was not the source of my gospel. He was not the source of my apostleship. I didn't kneel down and have him put his hand on me and pray for me that I would become an apostle. I just went up to get to know him because I was already an apostle. That's the point of the shortness of the time in Jerusalem. Verse 19, but I saw no one of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother, wants to be meticulously careful not to get his facts wrong because they're going to check them out. In what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. This really matters. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in, the pers in person in the churches of Judea. That's where the apostles work. They don't even know me there. I'm not behind the scenes circulating trying to pick up stuff secondhand from the apostles in their territory. I'm avoiding that. They don't even know me there where the apostles work. So the point of 16 to 21 is that flesh and blood, any human resource at all, flesh and blood, no apostles, no other human, flesh and blood did not call me, Flesh and blood did not reveal Christ to me. Flesh and blood did not teach me the gospel. Flesh and blood did not make me an apostle. Flesh and blood did not make me dependent. I am not dependent on Peter and James and John. There is zero, no apostolic succession from the 12 to Paul, none. This is not a succession. This is bolt out of the blue Christ. That man is mine and he's my apostle for the Gentiles. Step number four. Paul is radically new. He's radically new. And he's changed as a new man. He says can only be accounted for by the risen Christ, by the glory of God. So he ends his description here, verses 20 to 24, of his freedom from influence with the amazing impact that his life had on the churches in Judea. He says, then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, verse 21, now 22, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. So during all those years of, of, of circulating, those three, he didn't go there. He wasn't known among them. They were only hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. 
So Paul the persecutor, Paul the destroyer of Christians, Paul the Pharisee, who was advancing in Judaism beyond many of his own contemporaries, this Paul is preaching Christ crucified, risen, righteous as the foundation alone of your right standing with God. And he's doing it at enormous cost to himself. And they saw it and gave God credit. They glorified God, which is exactly what Paul meant for them to do. Which leads now to step number five. All of verses 13 to 24 are written to support this. So we've got ourselves from the end of the chapter backwards up to verse 13, and those, that unit, 13 to 24, you can see that it begins with because, and it's an argument for this fifth point. Paul's apostleship and his gospel came from Christ directly. Came from Christ directly. Verse 11. I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Christ. So three negatives and one massive positive. Negative number one, verse 11, the gospel I preach is not man's gospel. It's not of human origin. I didn't get it. Negative number two, verse 12, I did not receive it from any man. Negative number three, verse 12, I was not taught it by any man. So that's the point of 13 to 24, all that distance. I went to Arabia, I went to Damascus, I didn't circulate in Judea, I didn't go up to Jerusalem except for 15 days, I didn't see any of the apostles. You get the point. The point is, I didn't get this from man. That's the point of those verses. Here comes the massive positive at the end of verse 12. It came through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So he means most immediately here his message, his gospel. His gospel came not from Peter, but from Jesus Christ. And we know he means his apostleship and authority did as well because of verse 1 when he uses the very same language to describe his apostleship. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ. So his apostleship, not, just like verse 12, not, 11 and 12, not from man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So the very first note he strikes in this book is, I'm an apostle and I didn't get it from any human being. I didn't get this authority, I didn't get this gospel from any human being. Now, a little pause here before we go to step number six. 21st century, how many are in this room? Six, 7,000? I don't know. Let it sink in that we right now in the 20th century facing Galatians are listening to a man firsthand, that is his words, firsthand, whose life overlapped with Jesus Christ. Just let that sink in. And who says that he saw the risen Christ, met him, received from him divine gospel, wisdom, not taught by men, 
And in his heart, he knew this is real. So here we are, face to face, with a first century man, no liberal, conservative historian doubts that Paul was real or that Galatians is authentic. Nobody does that. The Muslims who say the whole New Testament, including Galatians, I suppose, was rewritten to add the death of Jesus, they're whistling in the dark. They don't have a shred, not a shred of historical evidence for those claims. That's pure escapism. So we have here an encounter between us and a first century Jew who overlapped with Jesus, who says he saw the risen Christ. And what that means is that before this conference is over, I mean, you're going to hear this man's voice six times, six messages from Galatians. And your heart will respond in one of three ways. One is, this man is an imposter, and he's deceiving the world and giving his life to do it. Two, this man is poor, deluded man who hallucinates and foisted on the other apostles and all the churches uh, his il illusion, his craziness, he's a fool. Or this man is a bona fide experiencer of the risen Christ who spoke to him and speaks to us through him. And the reason I say your heart will respond to embrace one of those and not your mind will decide which of those is because that embrace is not decisively a decision you will make. You will either perceive in the writings of the Apostle Paul over these six chapters an authentic, Christ-revealing spokesman for the living Christ, or you won't. You can't make yourself see that. You'll either see it or you won't. You'll either love it or you won't. You'll either embrace it or you won't. It'll happen like Paul. It'll be revealed in you, and the eyes of your heart will open to see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, or it won't. I'll just testify that after 60 years of walking with Christ, together with the Apostle Paul as my, my dear friend, whom I love very deeply, I love the Apostle Paul. I love him. I love him more than I love you, sorry. I don't know you. I don't know you well enough, but I know him, and I love the Apostle Paul. And I just want to testify, he's not a fool, and he's not an imposter. But you will wind up either, just get one more personal thing, Sunday morning, my daughter leans over to me, 21 years old, she leans over to me. This is the service is starting to do this, you know. Her phone showed me a Facebook post by a friend of hers who I know his parents who said, I'm no longer a Christian, I am a, an atheist, I don't believe anymore. And I thought, does he realize that he must look the Apostle Paul today, today, this is Monday, in the face and say, you're a fool or you're a fake. I tell you, not in a thousand years can I look the Apostle Paul in the face, knowing what I know from Romans and Galatians 
and Philippians and First and Second Thessalonians and look at him in the face honestly and say, you're a fool. You're a fake. Step number six. Therefore, since Paul is not dependent on men and his authority and his gospel come from Christ, he's not a man pleaser. And he can say the hard things that need to be said, which are going to be in just a minute. So verse 10. Now, am I seeking the approval of man or of God? If, if I, am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. One of the marks of seeing Christ through the scriptures for yourself is that you cease to be a man pleaser. But if your authority and your gospel are dependent on people you're going to be a man-pleaser. And if you're a man-pleaser, it's always one eye watching what they're going to think, what the congregation's going to think, what the TGC leader's going to think, whatever. Just one eye watching what people are going to say and think. What are the comments going to be at the blog? And what are the mentions in the tweeter? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> what, what, what are, what, what, if you got your eye on, on that, you won't be a faithful witness to Jesus. You'll be a coward, is what you'll be. So it's interesting, isn't it, that Paul, in this sequence of argument, aiming to say that he's an authoritative apostle alongside Peter, James, and John, did he bother with verse 10? I'm not a man pleaser. Probably just because the word began, I mean, the verse begins with four because he has just said horrible things. So let's go. Step number seven. Since he cares so little about the opinion of men, and since he knows that his gospel and his authority are from Christ, he tells angels they can go to hell if they preach another gospel. So, Michael, take that. Gabriel, you hear me? You preach another gospel down here? Be damned. That's pretty gutsy. I mean, they're pretty strong. Let's read it. Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Notice, he doesn't say, if Peter, James, or John preach a different gospel, let them be accursed. He could have said that easily. He said, I'm raising the stakes way higher than that. I'm talking about angels versus Paul. And Paul versus Paul. That's what I'm talking about. And he says, you, you, would, you would think that if an angel shows up and said, Paul, he's in a vision, right? He's in a vision. It's very bright, scary. And the angel says, Paul, you got almost everything right. You just left out circumcision. It's, it's needed in order to have a full right standing with God, you just can't throw that away. And he's an angel. And Paul says, get the hell out of here. Paul versus Paul is a little tricky, isn't it? So if, if I come authoritative infallible, 
when teaching to the church apostle, and I say, uh, I made a mistake. I now need to include circumcision in the ground of justification. And Paul answers, let Paul be damned. They say, whoa, wait a minute, which Paul should we damn? And he would say, the second Paul, because the second Paul considers the first Paul fallible. And apostles aren't. So he's wrong. It's a massive verse. You can see why the Reformation quoted verses 8 and 9. It's more than, more than almost any other verse with regard to the Reformation. Paul is calling false gospels out. By the way, I don't think Peter's dissimulation in chapter 2 contradicts what I just said. Because Paul explicitly says that's hypocrisy. Meaning, Peter has spoken the truth, knows the truth, and he's acting outside the truth. He calls it hypocrisy. And then in verse 15 of chapter 2, he says, we believe that a man is justified by faith apart from the works. I mean, you, you and I, Paul, we're one on, I mean, you and I, Peter, we're one on this, so would you just quit leaving lunch with the Gentiles? Which, which does mean that Great teachers can do very stupid, sinful things. Number eight, last one. It is absolutely astonishing that you would turn away from the God whose way of salvation is grace. Verses six and seven. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him, him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel. So isn't it interesting? I mean, I just find this so sweet. He has, this whole chapter would lead me to think that what he's going to say as the ground of his astonishment is, I'm just astonished that you are leaving a gospel given to you by one who got it straight from Jesus. That's not what he says. At the very moment where his astonishment is at its peak, he's saying, I can't believe you would leave him. You saw him crucified in my preaching. Didn't it penetrate? Oh, I pray. It did penetrate, didn't it? You saw him, and he called you out of darkness into marvelous light. You are leaving grace. Don't leave grace. What is there outside grace? That's, that, that's the ground of his astonishment, even though he spent his whole chapter building a case for his unique authority. Verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. You could have leave him. He gave himself for you to deliver you so you will not come into judgment when this old age is judged. You know people, your family, your kids, your mom and dad are being lured by false gospels every day. And you're in their life for a reason. And you need to learn from how Paul spoke. Here's the way he spoke in chapter 5. Look, look, behold, look. I, Paul, now that, that carries a lot of weight now. I, Paul, say to you 
if you accept circumcision, it's over. Christ will be of no advantage to you. Are you kidding me? Just add circumcision. Just add circumcision. It's over. Christianity is over. Christ will be of no advantage to you. Every man who accepts circumcision as part of his right standing with God is obliged to keep the whole law, which of course nobody can do. You are severed from Christ. If you add law keeping of any extent or any kind as a necessary part of the ground, the basis of your standing with God, you have fallen away from grace. And if you try to take others with you, I'm calling down damnation on you. Don't nullify the grace of God. Chapter 2, verse 21. Don't nullify the grace of God. If any part, if any part of your right standing with God is law-keeping, Christ died in vain. Wow. So I close. If the gospel is precious to you, I hope it is. How can it not be? Under Christ, the most precious of all. If the gospel is precious to you, I hope and I pray that you'll hold fast to the gospel and to the, the unerring authority of Paul who says that the two are inextricable. That's the whole point of the formal principle in Galatians 1 and 2. If my authority fails, then gospels can be many because Christ has not spoken through me. Luther saw this. Here's the way he spoke about Galatians 1.8. I consider it proper that the words of Scripture in which the saints are described as being deficient in merits, so Scriptures are saying you're deficient in merits, are to be preferred to human words in which the saints are said to have more merits than they need, for the Pope is not above but under the Word of God. That's the Reformation bell that's ringing. The Pope is not above but under. It's not even alongside. So the Roman Catholic Church today would say this, alongside with, this, with the Pope, of course, giving the decisive interpretations and therefore ruling the word. And then he quotes Galatians 1.8, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary than that which you preach, let him be accursed. Indeed, indeed, the Pope is under the authority of the apostles, the scripture, and if he, the Pope, or an angel, or an apostle, or any media, or any blog says there is another way to be right with God than justification by grace alone, through faith alone, on the basis of Christ alone, minus circumcision and every baptismal thing you might add to it, let him be accursed. I pray that not only will you love, when this conference is over, that you, you will not only love the apostolic authority and not only love the apostolic gospel, but that you will feel the apostolic seriousness. The seriousness of astonishment that people in your life, your family, your church are walking away from grace. The seriousness of anger at those who devote their lives to giving distorted gospels that destroy souls, and especially the seriousness of joy, inexpressible and glorified that your sins are forgiven because he died for them, and that your right standing with God, your right standing with God is based on grace alone, through, received by, appropriated in the union with Christ by faith alone, on the basis of Christ 
plus nothing to the glory of God alone. Let's pray. So, Father, that's what we long for, a seriousness of astonishment, a seriousness of anger, a seriousness of joy in the gospel and in the authority of your word. Oh, establish your people. Pray in Jesus' name.